I mean, if you got your Bibles, go to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, and we're going to read a couple of verses here. And uh, Luke chapter 4, uh, this is right after Jesus has come out of the wilderness experience that he had. He was in the wilderness. Uh, Satan himself saw to uh, the temptation of Christ and trying to get him to stumble and fall and to bow a knee. Uh, and when Jesus came out, the Bible says that Satan uh, was trying to wait for another, for a more opportune time to come at him. He was waiting for Jesus to have a bad day or have some extra drama in his life and be distracted from the care, from, from, from and get his eyes off God, off the Father and seeing if he could trip him up. The thing is, he just never gave him another time. Amen. He never gave. He never gave the. Uh, the enemy and an, an opportunity. Then, then it describes in Luke chapter four. Continuing, uh, he goes into the synagogue, which is his habit to do. And when he goes in, they randomly hand him a scroll, and the scroll was from Isaiah. And when he opened the scroll, this is the verse from Isaiah. It's repeated here in in Luke chapter four. And uh, this is what he read. He said, "The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the to um to the captives, and recovery of sight." to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And so he says that there's a way that people get set free through the word. There's a way that, that people get their, their lives changed and, and, and the, the dead ends they're facing, all of a sudden new avenues open up. And he said that power is called the anointing. And what the anointing is, are y'all okay this morning? The anointing is the power of God op- that God gives and operates through human flesh. And so, and I'm going to show you this in just a moment. We're not going to do a, a deep teaching on this today. Have somewhere else where I want you to go. But one thing I have found over uh, the last 30 years uh, here in, in this church, and, and even before I came here, that one of the, the biggest things that I've seen, in, in, you know, as far as what God leads me to see, uh, when it comes to praying for people, uh, and, and we do we do healing school here on Tuesday uh, at eleven o'clock. If you'd like to join us, it's right here in the intercessory prayer room. You can watch online. But but one of the biggest things that I feel that that the enemy has opened the door to is more mental attacks than physical attacks. Now, anytime you're being attacked, it's, it's detrimental. You know, you, they, your world stops. Anytime you physically are attacked, mentally attacked, financially are attacked, you know, you, you, all your resources and me- mental, uh, y- mentally you go straight to the problem, trying to solve it, do whatever you can. But God says here, Jesus says here, he's reading, and he says there, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. To the who? There is a gospel to the poor that you don't have to be. But, you, you know, I can sit here and tell you that, but, the, but poverty is broken under the anointing. Amen? And then he talks about people who are brokenhearted. Amen? Anybody ever had a broken heart? Yeah, I, I think in my, my personal ministry, I deal more with, more with the mental attacks, the devil mess, bringing fear in people's lives, torment in people's lives, and, 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 and helping to mend broken hearts. And, you know, a lot of times when we read the Scripture, we, we don't take brokenheartedness uh, very serious. But brokenheartedness a lot of times leads to broken spirits. And, and, and a lot of times if our heart is broken, if, if any time our hope is deferred, anything we were believing for, anything we put our trust in, just ask anybody who's been through a terrible divorce made vows standing in front of each other, and for one reason or another, those vows were broken or somehow skewed. The enemy got in somehow. It doesn't matter uh, uh, about how, how the divorce happened, but everybody leaves with a broken heart. The problem is they never get healed from that broken heart enough to go into the next relationship healed. They go into the next relationship with a, with a broken heart, compounding the problems in the next relationship. This isn't a marriage thing either. This is talking about the anointing. Amen. The anointing, God has given the anointing uh, when the word is preached. And it's not limited to preachers. It's limited to when you talk about the gospel, when you talk to people about Jesus, you can feel there's a certain anointing that comes on you. And you, you, it's, it, it, you can lay hands on the sick and see them recover according to the word. Amen? 
it ha- just happens to be that Jesus uh, had, had been labeled as a good teacher, a good man, a righteous man, a, a pretty decent uh, minister in his own right, but all of a sudden th- there's something else breaking forth in his ministry and, and the anointing is being present. Amen? Amen. And so what they saw after this was the birth of miracles and signs and wonders. Jesus went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, healing all that were sick. Amen? It didn't matter. Do you, do, you, do you realize that Jesus never said, what's your problem? I can, I can help you with that. I can't help you with that. The anointing, there was something about the anointing that had power to break whatever was trying to control people's lives. Amen? I want to just show you this. Let's go to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. Um, this is something very powerful. I've shared this with Healing School a couple of times. It's just a revelation that I had. Luke chapter 5. Uh, this is tar- starting to talk about, you, you, you know the story, the, the four friends that couldn't get into the house. What, what did they do to, to get their friend healed? Jesus was in the house. What did they do? Yeah, went through the roof. So let's look at this just for a moment. The, just read this. We'll read this very carefully so that you can see it. Luke chapter 5 verse 17 says that now it happened on a certain day that he, Jesus, was teaching. Listen to this. Teaching. The word, he's teaching, that, that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by. Where, where is Jesus? Where does this take place? In a house. We know this because the rest of the story says that they could not get to Jesus. He was in the house surrounded by these scribes and Pharisees. That's why they had to go through the roof. This is important. Now, it happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. They they were like, hey, let's just all get together. Let's go surround this guy, Jesus. uh, Jesus was like, hey, come on in the house. Sit down. When they sat down, he started teaching. They probably didn't want to hear what he had to say, but he was teaching. Here's what he was teaching. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. What was Jesus teaching in this house? Healing. The power of God to heal. Now, this is something I want you to understand. When this, now, there were people who were sitting outside who were not scribes and Pharisees, teachers of the law, hearing this word. So much so that four guys said, let's go get our friend, our brother, and bring him back here. And they tried to get into the house. When they could not get into the house, they made a way to get on the roof, move the thatch, and go down, drop him into the room to get Jesus to lay hands on him. Now, I want you to know a few things. Jesus was teaching. He was teaching under the anointing of God. He was teaching on healing because the power of God was present to heal. No one in the house was taking advantage of the anointing. But also, those teachers of religious law, listen to me, religion will always block the anointing. They, nobody was saying, hey, guys, look at these guys. They're bringing their friend in, their brother in, who has, they're carrying him on a mat. Let's get out of the way so he can come to Jesus. They stood their ground. They were not going to move. Religion finds a way to block. The anointing finds a way to heal. There was a teaching. There was, he was teaching. There was anointing to heal. And I'm sure one of the, the scribes or the Pharisees or teachers of the law were sitting there going, man, my sciatica is certain, messing up, uh, is, is acting up. Well, I sure would like to get in that line, but I ain't going to be the first one to walk down. Religion refuses the anointing. And I'm not saying this because I'm teaching all on the anointing today. I'm going to take us to a place that th- these are, where I'm going to take us to today has been the most misunderstood book in the entire Bible. 
Matter of fact, it is one of the, the places that I teach from least in the last 35 years of being in ministry. But after I prayed about it and I started asking God about it, the Lord showed me something that I think we need to see today. Are y'all ready? Okay, with that in mind, let's go to the book of, where are we going? What what did you say? Song of Solomon? <laughs> the book of Job. Let's go to the book of Job. You said it? That's, that's great. Awesome. The book of Job. The book of Job... Uh, is can be the best worst place for anybody to read the Bible. I, I'm 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 very serious. I have read Job and been more confused about God. Like God, what what are you messing with this boy for? What what's wrong with you? But then you start learning the character of God, and the story starts making more sense. There are some quoted things in Job. There are things that were actually said. That, that, that were written down, but they do not reveal the true character of God. Amen? Okay. Because a lot of people have built a lot of doctrine and tradition on some of the sayings out of the book of Job. And they have lived them so long, but they have seen no power in their life. They've seen no change, no healing, no, nothing, because they've taken what Job said As a doctrine, but it is false doctrine. I'm not not beating Job down. Job learns. That's the thing. Job started one way, ended in another. But the story isn't really about Job. It is as much about Mrs. Job. (laughs) Mrs. Job has played the villain. Am, am Am I right? She has played the villain. We're going to talk about this today. Maybe she's not as much a villain as you think. Job, now, here's the thing about Job. If, if I were to say, oh, service went longer and I had to close right here, I would close with Job chapter 3, verse 25. Fortunately, that's where we're going to start. Job's troubles were not a result of God singling him out or the enemy saying, uh, hey, I need somebody to curse. If you start in Job chapter 1, if you don't understand the character of God, this is exactly the, the doctrine you would walk away with. Job's troubles did not start in Job chapter 1. They started in Job, they're revealed, they started in Job chapter 3. Okay, Job chapter 3 verse 25. And I know I'm skipping, I'm going to go back and, and let you see what happened to him. But I want you to see the true way, the reason it happened. Job has has pronounced this. He has released this out of his mouth. He has a a revelation in chapter 3 of Job. He has a revelation of all the things that have gone on in his life. Because it's easy to blame God when things don't go right. It's easy to blame the devil when things don't go right. The devil only has access when we give him access. Okay, y'all, y'all, y'all just hanging on, aren't you? Okay. Job chapter 3. Job himself is going to reveal the story of Job. He says, for the thing I greatly, I greatly, the thing I greatly feared has come upon me. And what I dreaded has happened to me. Job did not, his door was not opened by the enemy saying, you know, I just don't like Job. I'm going to make it hard on him today. Or God saying, you know, Job, you're getting on my nerves. I think I, think, I, think I just need to bring you down a notch. Job reveals Job's problem. Job feared. Job loved God, but lived in fear. So, are you interested to know what he was afraid about? Let's go to chapter 1. Job chapter 1. As you're turning there, fear, just not, not, not out of 
breaking down theological, you know, Greek and Hebrew. Fear, just out of a dictionary, says an unpleasant, often strong emotion caused by anticipation or awareness of danger. Okay, that's, that's okay. That's, that's, not, that's not good enough, though. Fear is the plan of the enemy to keep you from faith. Is you, are you in James, Job chapter 1 yet? So I'm going to stop off at another place. Just keep your finger there. J, J, James, I started to say Jason. James, Jason, James chapter 5 verse 11. This is the only time Job is mentioned in the New Testament. Now, I will tell you, I have heard this scripture misquoted by people who swear they never misquote scripture. Okay? They say, they, they quote this scripture saying that the Bible says Job is the sufferer. Have you ever heard that? Job the sufferer. Here's what James 5.11 says. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance. Some translations say endurance, perseverance, and steadfastness of Job. There's no place in here that calls him a sufferer. Now, let me ask you this, just, just personally. Did he suffer? Heck, yeah, he suffered. He suffered big. But the Bible was not more interested in what he suffered than his breakthrough. Has anybody, let me just ask you this. Have you ever read the whole book of Job? I have read Job, and I was like, oh, God. <laughs> have you got a shorter version of Job? Are there cliff notes I can get somewhere? <laughs> I read through it, and just when you, it's, it's you're like, oh, somebody said something good, it gets dark for like a chapter and a half. Like, Job, you call these guys friends? These aren't your friends? That was just, it, it just, it's, it's a roller coaster ride. And he's, but he's called Job. The, endur the uh, endurance, the whole story of Job is only, is, is this, most scholars say that his whole story lasted between six and nine months. When you read the book of Job, you think, 45 years this boy's been suffering. <laughs> Am I the only one who thought, man, when he suffered, man, he must, it must have been like three generations he was covered with bulls laying on the side of that road and his wife would let him in the house. That's the way Job, the, the story of Job appears. But most, most scholars say that this, the, the, minimum, the maximum this lasted, his, his troubles lasted was nine months. But he's called the perseverer. He stood with God through what he is experiencing. Y'all are at chapter 1. I'm not there yet. Here I am. Okay, Job chapter 1, starting in verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz, okay? Whose name was Job. Now, Job, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this in a minute. And that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. Job's off to a good start. Now, if you want to know when this is written in the Bible, it's right before Psalms. But in the context of when it was written chronologically, it was back in the middle of Genesis. He was probably a contemporary of somebody like Moses or Abraham, somebody of that stature. Okay? So there was a man in the land of Uz, his name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. Okay, that's a good reputation. Verse 2, Job had seven sons and three daughters were born to him. He's got ten kids. Okay, he's a family man. He's good with God. He's a family man. Verse 3, also... His possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, five herds, 500 yoke of oxygen. Oxygen. <laughs> yes, I'm an oxygen wrestler. <laughs> Hit them up, move them out. 500 female donkeys and a very large household, five generators, six chainsaws, and a skid steer loader. There we go. <laughs> So that man was, so listen, so that man was the greatest of all the people of the East. 
This is, these are carefully written words. This was a man of prominence. He was good with God. He was a family man. He had a great reputation. He was financially, more than financially stable, very prosperous man. Now, verse 4. Here's where the story takes a little turn. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day. So they'd have a brother number one would have a party, then brother number two would have a party, and they'd just go from brother to sister's house, and they would just have these parties all the time. He said, and they would feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was, here's the fear. So it was when the days of feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify them, okay? And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Job did this regularly. Job's fear was that his kids would not follow in his footsteps. Okay, I, I, can, I can deal with that. But he would get up, and these, these were not like 12 and 13-year-olds. These were full-grown adult kids with their own families who were responsible for their own relationship with God. And so when, when, when Job would get up every day, his fear was, what if, what if in a drunken stupor my kids got in a conversation and cursed God? What, what, if, what if they're walking away from God? What if they're, they're denouncing him right now? i got to get out there and sacrifice for him. His sacrifice, their, their relationship with God was their responsibility as adults. But he was sacrificing like they were still under his roof. He lived in constant fear that he was going to lose his kids to the world. He's been a good provider. He's been a role model. But he was, he was in fear. And this, here comes this fear. Listen, the Bible said that God was, God was good with him being a righteous man and a good man, a, a man who, who, uh, who, who, you know, was socially, financially very well adept. And he, he had all these things. But there was something in him opening a door. And it was fear. It was fear. The story ain't even about Job, y'all. We got to get through this to get to the real story, okay? Okay, Job uh, chapter 1, verse 8. And so let me just give you a little condensed version of this. Satan comes in to God's presence. He's got a few little demons with him. Some other angels are there. And a conversation is is ensued by, by Satan saying, uh, hey, um, God says, hey, Satan, what are you doing here? Where you been? Oh, I've been I've been roaming the earth. And boy, you got a messed up planet down there. I see I see people more living for me than they do for you. And God just simply says, "Have you considered my servant Job?" Now, if God's going to do that kind of stuff, I know what we're thinking. God, leave me out of it. <laughs> I was doing fine over here, but the reason God said this is because Satan had legal access to him. He was not inviting Satan into his life. If When you go back and read it, you'll see that God put parameters around the attacks. He said, uh, if you consider my servant, uh, my servant Job, he's blameless. There's no one like him on the earth. He, he fears God and shuns evil, verse 8 says. So Satan answered and said... <laughs> Yeah, God, Job fears you because you protect his stuff. If, you let, if, you, if he didn't have that stuff, if he lost all that stuff, he would curse you. The door was open through fear. So Satan goes out and attacks. In verses 14 and 15, he loses all of his donkeys. And the servants who watched the donkeys died that day. One escaped to go tell Job. Verse 16 says, fire comes down and kills. Verse chapter 1 said he had 7,000 sheep. He had a 7,000 sheep barbecue that day and was not invited. That was cold. I'm sorry, y'all. Verse 17 says, um, 
they, a band of robbers came in and stole 3,000 camels and killed the servants who were watching the camels. Verses 18 and 19. A servant comes in and says, Job, I, there was a wind that came, and it just came from all, I, I couldn't tell if it came from the north, south, east, or west. It was like it just hit your son's house. All your sons and daughters were in that house, and the house collapsed on them. They are all dead, lost 10 kids. That moment he became, uh, he lost his prosperity, and he lost his children in one moment. But the Bible says in all this, verse 22, in all this Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. Job was saying, look, if there's something going on, it's either got to be God or me, and I know it's not God. Man, it's powerful. What, what would you say if you lost you know, when we have, I, I do a lot of counseling with people who, who lost children before they were even born. And they're, they're, they're just sideways with, with, why did God do this? And what, what happened? You know, and tons of questions. Job chapter 2. Satan comes back after challenging God to let, hey, take his stuff, he'll curse you. Well, he didn't curse you. And, and, Job, and Satan said to God, said, God, uh, if you let, if, yeah, he, he, his body wasn't touched. That's why he's still praising you. That's why he's still serving you. You touch his body, you let me have a little access to that body, and uh, he will curse you. Watch. What is, what is God trying to do in all this? Close the door on fear. He's just trying to close the door. There's an open door. And he says, okay. He says, well, you have access. There's an door, open door. But here's the parameter. You can't kill him. So next thing you know, Job's out there just a few days after mourning his kids, buried 10 kids, all of a sudden what happens? He starts seeing these little sores pop up on his body and they start itching. The Bible said they itched so bad that he broke a, pot, a piece of pottery and took the piece of pottery to scratch his skin. He was oozing and bleeding so bad his wife wouldn't even let him in the house. You know I'm getting that on my furniture. Chapter 2 is where this is, I said all that stuff for the last how many ever minutes to get to this. Then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. Guys, let me give you a little side note. Listen to me. If, if you date a girl who says just die, it's not going to be a good relationship, Okay. We have made, now let, let me say this. How many of us have made Job's wife a villain? Come on, let me see. Let me see. Raise your hands high and proud. Come on. There you go. Okay. She said, in the middle of his pain, why do you still hold on to your integrity? Why, why do you feel like, you need to say something bad. You, just, just let out a cuss word let me thank you, human. He's sitting there keeping his mouth shut because with the mouth shut, you sin less. I fell out right there, okay. She said, curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good? From God and shall not accept adversity. I didn't hear you running your mouth when you were spending all that money out of all the. the... Okay, I'm a villainizer just for a half second. Okay, you 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 got the nicest wagon in town. Wait, I better change that. You got the ni nicest chariot in town. You go somewhere real real bad real fast saying somebody's wagon. Okay. You got you you live in the biggest house. You you've had 10 kids. I didn't hear you complaining at all. I didn't hear you saying anything bad about God when you was living good. We get this little season of things bad happening and now you want me to curse God and die. You ready to just give up on God? Here's what I want you to understand. 
about Job's wife. This book is called Job, not Mrs. Job. No, this is important. Chapter 2 is the last time she is mentioned in the book of Job. She opened up her mouth one time and for the next 40 chapters, silence about her existence. Here's, you remember when we started talking, we talked about the anointing, healing broken hearts. Why was she saying things like, just curse God and die? See, we've always thought that Job lost 10 kids. She lost 10 kids. She didn't say things out of bad doctrine or animosity. She said those things out of hurt. We have villainized this woman for centuries. Curse God and die, curse God and die, curse God and die. Heard one comedian say recently, said, lost all the kids, lost all the possessions, but Satan left the wife. He knew what he was doing. No, I th- as funny as that sounds, it's totally wrong. Look, I'm going to explain to you in one verse the, ex- the whole entire story of Job. I have one verse. There are verses in here that describe the spirit of Leviathan. There are scriptures in here where, where, pe- where, where a, a young man named Yehu waits for, for all the, 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 the three friends to stop talking because he's a young man and he offers his advice to not take your eyes off God. Y'all are, y'all are saying things about God you shouldn't say. You're blaming things outside of your pay, pay grade. You're, you're, you're telling him that you, you're telling Job that he was an absolute sinner. The Bible said two times in the first three chapters, he was a righteous man. Sin wasn't his issue, fear was. And so we see all, we read all this book about Job, and we see all these amazing things and all these terrible things in one, in one book. And it gets to the end, and it says, after God had rebuked Job, he had rebuked his friends. What does the Bible say at the very end? Help me out. What does it say? Job's last part of his life was better than... That's a turnaround anointing. I don't know how many of you have suffered loss. I'm a little different when... I lose family. I, I learned years ago that if they're saved, I'm okay. I, I, I did my dad's funeral 10 years ago. I did Amy's mom's funeral. Um, I have shed less tears when I know people are in heaven, okay? My concern is the funerals I've done where I, I just had to facilitate a service because I couldn't get up there and say for sure where people are. Okay, I, when my, I've had people pass, I remember when my grandmother, my closest grandmother, probably the reason I survived to get to a place where I could be in ministry was because of my grandmother. She had this, maybe y'all, y'all can, she had a dresser with a piece of glass over the top. Anybody, anybody know this? It had pictures of all the kids and grandkids and under there, she walked by and prayed for each one of those kids every single day. That piece of glass under, pictures under that piece of glass, she'd lay hands on and pray for all of them. And I feel like her prayers really helped change my life. Amen? When she died, I had someone get on to me because I wasn't shedding the tears like everybody else. And <laughs> I was very, I mean, she was, she, she didn't, you know, pass away at a young age. She passed away at a ripe older age. Uh, she had more physical difficulties. Amy and I went to her house one day, and uh, she would run through the list of names. She would call me everybody's name, uh, Wade, David, Phil, and then she would finally go through the name, uh, all the names of all the guys in the family and get me last. And so Amy and I recognized some memory issues, and we prayed for her standing in her kitchen one day. She didn't have memory issues for almost 10 years later. 
so I knew my grandmother. And I knew when she passed that that passing was the appointed time. But there are some of you in here that experience someone who passed away and it's not the appointed time. I'm just going to tell you, there are people who uh, pass away before they complete their, their life, what they were called to do. Uh, they don't take care of themselves. They, uh, you know, live the wrong lifestyle, contrary to what they know God. They, they run from their calling. There are people who have ended their lives. There's, there's all kind of traumatic things we could talk about. But a broken heart is a broken heart. Some of you have dated somebody and, and, or married somebody and poured your, your whole existence, given them your, your whole heart, only to have something happen and you end up with a broken heart. And, and I find that praying for people who have cancer, I get quicker results praying from people with cancer than I have getting quicker results from people who have a broken heart. I've seen physical things change at the moment we pray, but I have not seen broken hearts heal as quickly. Are you with me? So for 40 chapters, we don't hear again about Job's wife. We don't hear about her again. But the whole book of Job is about this, a man trying to revive and renew his wife to God. Because she is mentioned one more time. You don't see it. You have to look for it. Job went through all he went through. Yeah, he, he suffered, but he persevered. He cried out to God and God answered. But the whole book of Job is about a husband trying to get his wife restored. I'm going to prove it. Job chapter 42. Doesn't mention her name, but here's what it says. At the end of Job, at the end of the story of Job, the whole end, it talks about he's got more cattle than he's ever had before. He's got more sheep, more donkeys, more servants than he's ever had before. And here's how I know she was restored. Job 42, verse 13. And he also had seven sons and three daughters. Well, what does that mean? I don't hear a woman with a broken heart is not willing to have 10 more kids with you. I can see her watching from the window. What is that fool out there doing? Who are all these people hanging out with him? What, what can they be talking about for the last two weeks out there? Look at him still scratching himself with pieces of pottery. And he just continues to praise the Lord. Just continues to speak in God's favor. He got off track a little bit. I know I didn't sin. Yeah, of course, God said you didn't sin, but you had fear in your life. Let's close that door. And the more he was restored and stood the more healed her broken heart became. Because I can tell you this, after losing 10 kids, it would, be, it would be very hard with a broken heart and a broken spirit and without trust in God and having more and having fear that if you have another one, it will come out the same as the last 10 When he got his breakthrough, I can see her walking out of the house going, praise the Lord. She was willing to have 10 more kids, 90, 90 months, 90 months again. <laughs> no, she, she went through 90 months with the first, is my math right, 90 months? 90 months of her life bearing 10 kids. All this disaster came. Then her husband gets attacked and is sick. But he, he pushes and perseveres. He says, I've got 
to break through so my wife can break through. Does that make sense? Get the praise team to come back up here. Try to do that miracle after miracle thing again. That kind of hit, didn't it? Whew. Now I tell you, when when I, I, I when it, when I do Bible readings and you have to go to Job, you're like, oh, Job. I mean, I tell you what, when I, when God started revealing these little things, let's all stand up. Come on. Get our elders to come down here. Or some of our staff to come down here, please. Be prepared to, to pray. Ron and Sherry, will you all come and pray, please? Anita, will you come and pray? Broken hearts are not limited to teenage puppy dog romances. Oh, well, I loved him and he broke my heart. He dated my friend. They got my coffee wrong at Starbucks. These, there are some real things that break people's hearts. And, and so, even through this storm, some of you were crying out, where, God, where are you in all this? I'm, I'm just going to tell you this. Watch God restore. Watch God restore. Watch what God is doing. He is restoring. Some of you had some loss, but you're going to have better than you had before. God is, look, listen to me. Whoa, 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 whoa. God is not a subtractor and he's not a divider. He's an adder and a multiplier. Come on. He's, he promised, promised he would never leave you nor forsake you. Some of you, I know you want to track down your insurance agent find out where they live and just follow them home from the grocery store or something pray things are turning things are turning shifting on your behalf Amy talked about earlier there's a season through this look Job went through a storm Jesus went through storms you we went through storms watch what happens on the other side of the storm when Jesus was listen to me when Jesus, famous story, when Jesus was in the boat with his disciples, what did they face in the middle of the ocean? Say it. What happened when they got to the other side? Deliverance. No, no. They went to the gatherings. If they didn't have the faith for the storm, they certainly wouldn't have had it for a demoniac. And I'm telling you, people are going to watch you and they got broken hearts, they don't know God to turn to. Those of you that know God, you need to persevere through this thing so that they're restored by watching your actions.